This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, so seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.31 p.m. And we will start with a roll call attendance. Um, and, and actually, before we start, I would just say, um, for uh, Hala had just mentioned that um, Sasha is, is here helping us um, uh, host this meeting, um, but she can't hear us. So um, I um, can text her if, if anything comes up, or we can use the chat um, to, to contact her if we need to. Um, so we'll, uh, roll call, um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Um, on our agenda, it says we're going to approve minutes from June 16th, but they weren't included in our packet. So if folks are okay, we'll move on. Um, and we do have um, public comment this evening. So I'll play the uh, voice recordings first. Hello, my name is Aaron Jensen. I live in Amherst and I work at Fort River in the Ames program. I would like to advocate for distance learning to be the default plan for the upcoming school year with the potential for in-person add-ons. Our buildings and school grounds are still valuable resources, even when learning virtually, and we should consider how to use them to supplement virtual learning. I would only feel comfortable about a return to the buildings if they remained mostly empty with ample safety precautions in place. We need to consider that even if our local COVID numbers look good, this is still a national emergency. And until the country is able to contain the virus, we should assume our district is just as vulnerable as anywhere else. The sooner we know a full reopening is off the table, the sooner we can put effort into resources into strengthening our distance plans. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jean Fay. I'm an Amherst resident and a paraeducator of 22 years in the Amherst Public Schools. I'd like my remarks to be included in the public comments portion of the July 23rd meeting of the Amherst School Committee. As the past president of APEA, I spent countless hours addressing con growing concerns from educators about the poor air quality in our schools. Decades of underfunding of public education and deferred maintenance of our buildings has resulted in ventilation systems that are inadequate under the best of circumstances. Any decisions on reopening our schools to in-person learning should not happen until the school committee can assure the educational community of our town that there has been a complete environmental health and safety assessment of our buildings and all aspects of the heating, cooling, and ventilation systems are fully functioning. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alicia Lopez. I left a comment earlier but got cut off and I've modified my comments to hopefully um, reach within the time. So please use this comment. This is from um, ELL Teachers in Amherst. Myself, Blanca Osorio Castillo, Manny Mandel, Rez Shahadi, and Nava Tavares Smith. We're writing um, to reiterate our concerns about the reopening plan presented by the district. It should be noted that the district did not seek input, nor did it include ELL teachers in the decision making process. We are witnessing a moment in history where we are calling for change and a dismantling of rules and laws that favor certain populations. In a spirit of fairness and equity, we ask that you seriously consider our concerns as they impact some of our most vulnerable students. Far too often, decisions impacting ELLs are made without ELL family input. We advocate for the families of our students and we ask that you join us in considering what is best for them with our input. Many ELL families, dissuaded by language barriers, have instead opted to share with us directly their reluctance to send their children back to school in September. Therefore, we need up-to-date information that accurately reflects their current decision. In addition, many families are unaware of the conversation being held right now about their children and the decisions that could be made. We find it important to highlight the unique needs of the ELL program, which are different from the special ed programs or any other specialized programs. 
The ELL program is made up of students with individual language and unique academic needs. A room with students of different ages, language levels, and academic needs will be a detriment to our students' education and will place undue burdens on the ELL teacher and stress her differentiation skills beyond the level of good practice. Small group learning remains the best teaching method for our students and is achievable through remote learning. If the phase one of the reopening plan wants to focus on instruction for beginner ELLs and students in K-1, there are certain things that we feel that we need in order to serve our students and at the same time keep the safety of everyone a priority. And we've outlined these in the letter which we will submit to the school committee. We are aware of the complexities that we face in creating a scenario that will balance our students' learning needs with their safety and the safety of our staff. These are difficult times that require us to be creative and thoughtful in our thinking while also remaining honest about the dire limitations. We are committed to providing the best teaching environment possible in view of these limitations and to working together to achieve these goals. Thank you. Can you all see the, um, can you see it? Okay, thank you.
This is the written version of one of the voice comments that we received. So I will, I will scan more quickly to get to the details that were not in the voice message. And that's the that's the all of the public comment that we've received today. Um, and I will note for um, uh, the public watching um, online, um, we there were a couple other comments that were uh, clearly related uh, exclusively to the high school schedule and plan, or the middle school head, uh, schedule and plan, and so those will be shared at our next meeting of the regional school committee. This is, as a reminder, the Amherst School Committee, which is the Amherst School District of three elementary schools. Okay, um, I'm just gonna pull up our agenda. Um, so we uh, tonight we have one agenda item. We are uh, revisiting our um, fall 2020 priorities and um, planning framework, um, the staff section. Um, and then, oh, Mr. Demon. Uh, yes, I'd like to state for the record that my wife is an employee of the Amherst School District. However, I feel that I can perform my official duties objectively and fairly on this item. And so I have filed the necessary 23B disclosure of appearance of conflict of interest form with the Amherst Town Clerk as required by Mass General Law, Chapter 268A, Paragraph 23B, Section 3. And I will be participating in this item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we have one um, agenda item tonight to um, revisit our conversation on the, um, the staff section of our framework for planning. Um, we voted on both um, sections of this on, on Monday. The, the main part portions of the document passed our vote um, on Monday, July 20th, and um, the support for staff section did not pass. Um, and before we dive into this conversation, I just want to acknowledge, I think um, we all know, we hear it and we, we're reading it in, our, in, in, in the public comment and we're hearing it from our community members and I'm sure you all have also re received um, individual emails. And so I just wanna recognize um, that 
all of us. Um, so we, we, we talked about the district and we talked about our administrators and our teachers and the, in the immense volume of work and time and, and sweat that they're putting into coming up with creative solutions um, to this intractable problem that we are facing. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the work that all of us on the committee are doing um, in a time of also deep personal stress and anxiety. Um, this isn't easy and we're, we're layering on the weight of the entire community on our shoulders when we're trying to figure out our pathway forward for our own families and our own selves, um, which is anxiety producing enough. So I just want to acknowledge that. We've been putting, this is the third time we've seen each other this week. Um, and we've spent many, many more hours on it this week than I think we ever imagined we'd spend in, you know, in a six month period. Um, so I just want to, you know, express my gratitude, also personal gratitude for um, the hard work, the honesty and candidness that we've been having these conversations and the thoughtfulness that all of us have been putting into these, these really, really gut wrenching and difficult conversations and decisions. So I, I just want to start there. Um, of sort of deep appreciation. Um, these are hard conversations, um, but I, I, I'm grateful that this group is working so well together to have these conversations, so thank you. Um, so uh, with that, um, our packet um, does have um, the updated document. Mr. Harrington? Yeah, so um, as, a, as a member of ARP staff, Today I spoke with the uh, lawyer of the day at the State Ethics Commission, and so I, I feel like right now is the appropriate time for me to recuse myself from the conversation. Okay. I will mute and turn off. Okay, and I will uh, chat you when um, when you may come back. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Um, so. The uh, the agenda packet includes the updates that uh, that we had talked about and discussed at the the meeting the joint meeting that we had had on Monday. Um, I did my best to transcribe the scribbles of notes that I took. So um, open also and and we I shared this also with the other two committees that had voted um, and approved this one. Um, so. Um, I, I also open to edits if I didn't happen to capture the discussion that we had on Monday. Um, so uh, that is the intent. It was to capture the discussion that we had had on Monday and that had agreed um, at that point. So I will open it to conversation or motions. Ms. Spitzer. <laughs> All right, so this has probably been one of the longest weeks of, I don't, know, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but I'm going <laughs> to, I honestly think it's been one of the longest weeks of my life. Um, it's hard to believe it was just on Monday um, that I argued that we should do more to accommodate the preferences of our staff. I ask that we acknowledge that the needs of the staff and the preferences of the staff may lead to a mismatch between the number of teachers and the number of students who would like to be in this build in the buildings. And I argue that this is still a possible outcome, regardless of what language we put in this document. Staff members may make the decision to leave employment of the district, and I fear you know, that this would be one of the worst case scenarios, because we wouldn't have the staff for in person or remote learning. Um, I want to clarify because a lot of people have reached out and I think view my statements as supporting, you know, go moving to a hundred percent remote option. And, you know, and I'm not arguing for that now. Um, and I don't think I was arguing for that on Monday, although I, I understand that people have drawn conclusions from my statements. Um, at the same time, I, I do believe we need to be prepared to implement a fully remote option. <laughs> Sorry, it's my son. Um, even if we can all reach agreement today on the language that would allow us to offer an in-person option in September, none of us knows what's gonna happen. And there is a very strong likelihood that we will experience a COVID surge in our area. I, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't think any of us do. 
but we cannot ignore this probability. So while I understand the frustration um, that I heard from others that we have not provided guidance as quickly as people would like, I think even if we, at the end of this meeting, still have a strong preference for in-person learning, we need to be working on contingency plans now for a remote only option. And I know this is happening. Um, I don't doubt that the administrators we've heard from yesterday are, are doing this, but I, I don't think it's been communicated to the public. And, and from what I'm hearing from the teachers, I don't think they're feeling um, like it's, it's happening as much as it should. Um, I can't ignore the public comment from teachers and staff who are clearly saying they have concerns about next year. Having concerns about next year is the most appropriate response to the world we live in right now. And as a member of this committee, I have been trying to think about those who are most vulnerable, whether it's for medical reasons, for financial reasons, for developmental reasons, I could go on. There are many other factors that I haven't mentioned. This is an impossible task and there is no right to do, way to do this. And I think that everybody on this committee can appreciate that. Other thing I feel uncomfortable about is the fact that my vote on the Amherst School Committee could dictate whether Pelham goes remote only. And I haven't been elected by anybody from Pelham. I'm not a member of the Pelham Elementary School Committee. I understand why separate policies could be burdensome, especially under these circumstances, but I, I wanna recognize that as, as something I'm deeply uncomfortable with. Um, then and today, I'm looking for collaboration and suggestions on how we could make this document um, support our staff in a very meaningful way. One that I've had considered is strengthening the language around staff members who may not have medical condition themselves, but who live with someone who does. Now, I recognize that there are legal implications of what I'm about to recommend, and I have, because the chair is the only person who can engage with our council, I, I haven't been able to do that prior to this, but I would be open to doing so. Um, I suggest that if our council and the HR department find that this would be possible, that we revise the first two bullets. Um, I would suggest that we write, the district will provide reasonable accommodations for staff who have underlying medical conditions or live in a household with a person who has underlying medical conditions that make them more vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. I would suggest changing the second bullet to the district will seek to accommodate staff who for any reason express a preference for full or mostly remote remote work to the extent that such positions are needed and available and based on the instructional model and student preferences. I realize that this change could still lead us to reduce in-person time for some students. For this reason, I think we need to continue to engage with teachers now. I, I'm feeling uneasy about the fact that we delayed the survey um, to address their concerns and do what we need to improve our plans in response. At the same time, we need to make sure that we meet the needs of our students who are mo most at risk and to meet this includes our youngest as well. This is why I'm not asking for fully remote today. I could see that happening in the future um, if conditions change. To do this, we may need to create a survey of parents that ask parents how strong their preference is for in-person education. For example, you know, I'm gonna speak for myself. I have a strong preference for in-person education for my son, but due to my ability to work remote, I can make distance learning work for my oldest child. I think we need to collect this data because it would allow our district to better handle a potential mismatch that's gonna probably, it's not 100% likely, but there, there's a high enough probability that I think we need to plan for this. I recognize that this is asking a lot from our staff and our staff is already burdened, but I'm, I'm trying to think as creatively as I can in ways to move forward. I think we were presented with somewhat of a false dichotomy um, on, on Tuesday night between either, you know, going forward with the plans that we had or moving to a fully remote option. I'm proud of our district and our community for the work we have done so far. We have made sure that we are continuing to feed our children during this pandemic, working with our parents groups. We've provided Wi-Fi, hotspots, and Chromebooks to families who otherwise do not have access. We've showed up to anti-racist professional development and protests. We have shown that when we work together, we can help to make sure that we support those in our community who are more vulnerable. And I want us to continue to challenge ourselves to do this, even as we're all facing the exhaustion. <laughs> um, and I'm including staff and parents, you know, and the entire community. I read a New York Times article today and um, the school's chief in Richmond, Virginia, was quoted and he likened the entire conundrum that we're facing to playing a game of 3D chess while standing on one leg in the middle of a hurricane. And that's how I'm feeling. So 
those are my suggestions. Thank you very much. Sorry, that was a little long winded, but I had to get that out. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Yes, thank you. And I'll, I'll be long winded as well. So don't feel bad about it. Um, so I, I appreciate everything that Ms. Spitzer said and, and how she's advanced this conversation. Um, just a couple of detailed points on some um, some things she mentioned um, before I, I lose my train of thought. Um, in terms of um, making it vital that the district prepare for fully remote learning. So this is already in the framework document that our three committees have passed um, in two places. One is the district will provide plans for all grades to transition to fully distance learning if the public health situation necessitates school closure or other disruptions to in-person learning. And then we also elevated uh, another point to the fourth overall goal, remain flexible and adjust plans as needed according to changing conditions. So I feel like from the school committee point of view, that's as strong as we can make it. Um, is the district actually implementing that in a responsible way and communicating that? That's a different matter. And if we have concerns about that, we should absolutely bring that up in open meeting with the superintendent. Um, so this is my first um, opportunity to weigh in in a, in a public meeting on this. So I'd like to read a statement about why I'm in favor of the staffing guidance as presented um, without, without the proposed changes. The Amherst Public Schools are required by law to provide access to a free and appropriate education to all students in our district. That's the primary mandate of our organization as a public service provider, to meet the educational needs of students. To fulfill this requirement, we naturally have to identify what an appropriate education is. This, of course, is a never-ending discussion as we work to continuously improve our service offering in response to changing conditions. And it forms the bulk of our committee's work. Almost everything we do falls under this one primary mandate, an appropriate education. COVID, of course, has been an enormous change of conditions to respond to, which is why we've been meeting so frequently and for so long. And earlier this week, our three committees each unanimously voted to support the Fall 2020 Framework for Planning document that provides guidance to the superintendent on specifically what an appropriate education looks like to our committees under current local COVID conditions, including maximizing in-person learning time, prioritizing students unable to effectively access remote learning, and phasing in to all elementary students on site four to five days a week and secondary students at least two days a week. In order for us to then deliver on this, this framework of what our committees have now identified as an appropriate education under current conditions, we are obligated to staff it. Because if we can't staff it, then we can't reliably offer what we just identified is needed to meet our primary obligation. And in staffing this model, the first goal in the framework, the first guidance for implementing this model is protect staff and student safety. And so we're committed to responding to local conditions as advised by the AMA, Dr. Fauci, the just released Harvard Global Health Institute guidance and many other sources, we're phasing in, starting with 10% of all students on site. And we must continue to do our absolute best to maximize the safety of working conditions. We have to continue to push back repeatedly and hard against any state guidance that asks us to compromise on safety. Like we have, we were the first district in the Commonwealth to publicly commit to six foot distancing. We have to relentlessly advocate both in our town and statewide to secure the capital and operational funds needed to maximize safety. Like we have, it's been no small effort, but our committee has been instrumental in getting over 160 other school committees in the state to demand full funding for all COVID expenses. We have to continue to support our town manager to ensure the safest university return possible, an improving but still very active conversation. And we have to continue to meet week after week and listen to staff parents, the public, and each other to continuously improve our educational offering, but we cannot guarantee staff accommodations that by design would prevent us from delivering what we've identified as the free and appropriate education for all students. And so we should provide reasonable accommodations for staff who have underlying medical conditions. And further, we should seek to accommodate staff who for any reason prefer to work remotely, including concerns about household members who may be vulnerable. But we cannot offer a guarantee to all to work remotely when we know that positions are needed on site for the instructional model that we've identified as appropriate under current local COVID conditions. And I wanna add this phrase, seek to accommodate. It's not an empty phrase here. It's a powerful directive. Above and beyond what's required by employment law, it's a value statement that our committees expect the district to do just that, actively seek to accommodate staff who for any reason prefer to work remotely 
And we're trusting in human resources to evaluate each staff member's situation on a case-by-case -case basis and do all that they can to be sensitive to each of our employees' unique situations. And our committee should have every expectation that this will be the case. After all this, there's no question that the superintendent and the rest of our admin team have heard us loud and clear that staff safety is a top priority. And I have every confidence that more than any particular wording in a guidance document from us, we can put our trust in our school's leadership to uphold the true spirit of this guidance. And when making important individual staff decisions, that's what matters most to me. So I support the staffing guidance uh, as presented and I'm ready to vote in favor of it tonight. Thank you. Ms. Lord, would you, do you have any comments you would like to add? I will not be as long. Um, and I hear both Ms. Spitzer and uh, Mr. Demling's comments and incorporate them. My biggest issue, I think, was that our staff doesn't feel comfortable or a, a great majority of them do right now. So what are we doing to sit at the table I know one school during their um, staff meeting, they came up with over a hundred different questions and concerns. And so I don't wanna just barrel forward and say, you have to show up because this is the commitment you made. I wanna say, okay, this doesn't feel good. What can we, how do we work together to do it? Cause there are some in the gray area that just need to be heard. Um, I know there's not a lot of time. Everybody is working at max capacity and beyond that, but I can't in good faith make a, choice against without listening and sitting down at the table and, and doing some due diligence. Thank you. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I have to say for now. Well, I, I think what's, um, I, I, I was, I'd like to just sort of address um, some things that I, I feel like are, are misconceptions. Um, and I, and I think that there's, a little bit in in um, just in, within public comment, and, and as well as from both community members as well as staff. And we're not at the point that we have that we're defining specific plans, and neither is that the role of our committee. Our committee is putting together principles that we want to see our district administration do when they are. Um, preparing concrete plans and the plans that we saw on Tuesday they are even though they look more concrete than what's on these documents that we voted on Monday the the main framework um, about the education there's still a lot of detail that it has to be done and has to be it has to be worked out and I don't believe there I, I you know sort of echoing something that Mr. Demling said those can't be done without engaging with staff to define how they're going to implement the plan that that is been drafted and it's a draft um this isn't this isn't a playbook for exactly how everything's going to be done um that's still to come and i think um and i would actually echo very much um what uh, Mr. Demling said way better than how I can say it, frankly, um, that that clause of seeking to accommodate staff who for any reason, we added that in. That is not, that is us saying, we don't want to, we don't want to see the district just do what they are legally required to do by employment law in which actually is even more expanded in, in the pandemic. There are many more accommodations that are included now in employment law with with regard to um, our staff accommodations with regard to this pandemic um, and those continue into this school year so those aren't off the table we've gone beyond that in saying that we want them to also seek seek as much as they can to accommodate staff who for whatever reason are um, would prefer to not work in the building also I, you know, the other mis misconception is this, this um, phrase that I hear a lot, both in emails and public comment and conversations with people that were pushing for in-person education um, and in-person learning. And I would say one of the things that, that, that I think 
keeps getting forgotten is that we're not pushing for people to be in buildings if the if the local public health guidance and metrics suggests that that's not a wise decision. If that were the case, we would not be forcing anybody into the building, even if they wanted to be in the building. We would not be forcing people to go into schools if the health metrics at that time are suggesting otherwise. And so I think that's always a first step and, and I just sort of restating something that Mr. Demling said, that's our first, our number one goal and our overall goal is to protect staff and student safety. And then in, in our other, the other main document, we've said that that's the first thing that we're going to do before any decision about how we're educating students is made, is we are going to be looking at the science and the public health data before we do anything. And that's gonna be what's guiding us, not what I want for my child or anybody else in the community wants, if they, whether they want to be in person or not, we're going to first be looking at the science and the data. Um, and the other, the other sort of misconception that we're pushing for everybody to be in the school in, in just a few weeks in September. And I think when we added between the first time we looked at our document and the second time that we looked at their document, one huge, huge change was that we added that phased in approach. We asked for, and then we saw on Tuesday that phased in approach. Um, we're going to have at most 20, I think, or 30% of the students in the building. That also means that that's not all staff are in the buildings um, at the beginning of the school year. And that phased approach is going to be a cautious and, and, and public health data driven decision process about when, how quickly we go into phase two or phase three, or whether we move back um, you know, if we've moved up to phase two and we need to go back to phase one or even close the schools, that's always going to be at the forefront of the school year. So even though, yes, the, the idea is sort of maps a way, a, a pathway to getting all students in the school at least some of the time and, and, the, and the staffing in order to support that, we've mapped a way that is, that is very cautious and very data-driven so that we're not asking um, more risk than what our public health officials would suggest we need to be doing. So I, I think those for me are really important because in this, in this situation where there's so much uncertainty and so much anxiety and so much fear of the unknown, what we've put together is not a plan that's assuming the best case scenario and let's go, we're, we're put, we've put together a plan that says what has to be true for us to be able to have students and staff in our school buildings. And we've outlined, as Mr. Demling um, much more eloquently articulated, a safety plan that goes beyond what DESE has, has suggested we need to do. We've, um, we've also articulated a plan that has this phased in approach so that we're learning and adapting as we go and not just blindly moving forward. And all of this, the protocols that we've been out, frankly, ahead in talking about these before we've even gotten the guidance. We just got the guidance on facilities operation and transportation. And yet we've been talking about that. And I think um, we've looked at the risks and crafted a plan that addresses so many, so many of those question marks and no, it's not gonna address all of the question marks and all of the risk, but I, what makes me comfortable with the plan as we've outlined it, including the, the support for staff, is that we're first and foremost going to be looking at those public health data metrics. We're not gonna be asking anybody to do something that isn't warranted and supported by the public health data. If we were going, if we were looking, if today were August 31st and it was, we're looking at whether students are going into school next week, we'd be looking at the health metrics and it looks like, yes, that seems like a safe option. If it wasn't that, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, so I too um, am in support of what of our original document. Um, I, I do feel very comfortable with, we've gone beyond um, and expressed our sincere um, and, and passionate desire and need and requirement that our district works to understand staff preferences regardless of personal health conditions 
and, and seeks to accommodate them as much as possible. And ultimately, we're a public school, and we are required to provide that free and appropriate public education for our students. And if, if, we, if we are not putting our students first and thinking of our students first and their educational needs, then we're not fulfilling our mission as a public school district. I saw your hand, Ms. Bitzer. So I'm feeling frustrated because I, I came in with what I believe is some compromise language. And neither Peter nor you have responded to that. But I guess what I, I want to confirm that you are, because here's the thing, there are four of us here. If, if the two of you vote in favor of it and Hall and I don't vote for it, we're in the same position as we were before. And I'm, I don't feel good about that. I, I also, you know, the reason, the language I proposed was, you, we're talking about health from public health. There is good guidance that COVID is transmitted more among families. Like you're more likely to get it if a family member gets it than, I, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I, I, I've been trying to read a lot. Of, and if I am a teacher and somebody in my household, not myself, is recovering from cancer, if somebody in my house is immunocompromised for whatever reason that is, we say we will seek to accommodate, but we don't actually but what would we do in the event that that meant that one of our students couldn't get their, you know, the, the, the in-person education that I would love for them to have? But you're asking, I think you're asking too much of our teachers who might be in this situation. And I, I, I just, it's not based on, this is not, you know, based on, um, just generalized anxiety about the pandemic. There is good evidence that if you have certain conditions, you're at increased risk, COPD, diabetes, you know, these are things that are recognized by the CDC. I'm not saying we put that language in here. I think there are good reasons not to, but I would just like to see us commit that we're not gonna ask a teacher to have to like rent in, I mean, this was happening during the pandemic. Doctors were renting RVs so that they weren't gonna be worried about bringing COVID home to their loved ones. Um, it just, it feels like too much. I mean, if you sign up to be a doctor, that's one thing, but if you sign up to be a teacher, I, I don't know. It, it just really doesn't sit well with me. And if we can do something to, to say affirmatively that we won't put anybody in that position, I feel more comfortable voting for this document. Mr. Demling. So maybe while I'm talking, you can uh, write up the actual language so that we can present it so that um, we can hone in on a bit more, but I will tell you why I don't feel like I can vote for it, but I would like to see the details so we can, you know, not talk, so we can speak less abstractly. So to, to, to break it out to um, anyone in your household that has medical accommodations, that is a, so far beyond employment law that we put our district in an impossible situation of how to identify that. Whereas Seek to Accommodate is telling Doreen Cunningham when she evaluates, uh, who's our assistant superintendent, diversity and human resources, is going to be working with her human resources staff to evaluate this. But she, and I'm so sure she's watched these discussions. She needs to hear the committee loud and clear that you need to do everything you can while fulfilling the obligations that our district has to our students to seek to accommodate that. So I don't expect Doreen or anyone in HR to say, ha ha, I can use seek to accommodate to get out of accommodating. I think they're going to do that. And I, you know, I, I will, you know, offer a, a different point of view to the 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 um the false equivalency. There there isn't a false equivalency here. Um, if we can't staff, for example, the ILC program, then within a week or two, because again, this is the other problem we have right now. The time urgency is really working against us. If then then the director of special ed is going to have to start calling parents and telling them telling their that their students their special needs students who have been in our district some, many of them since kindergarten are going to get bust out of district to some place to be determined and we'll do the best we can because for those students 
we know it doesn't matter how long you design or invest in and train in remote. We know that for some students, we absolutely cannot provide FAPE, that, that legal requirement that our organization is bound by, free and appropriate public education. And, and it's, it's very real. And, and we can debate how many students there are, and we hope for the best that the staff works out, but we can't guarantee that. And we, and we can't have it both ways. I, I wish that we didn't have this, uh, this, this problem, but we do. And it's a very hard decision, but, we, but unless we are willing to, to, to do what I just described, and that, that's just one of the consequences that I don't think our superintendent was trying to threaten us with when, when, when he identified. And when he says that you know, those out of district placements are very expensive, and that we'll very likely have to go back to the town of Amherst. And, and if this has a ripple effect on the agreement at the region back to Pelham, Leverett and Shutesbury to ask for additional funds and include an additional budget freeze, those are just some of the consequences if we, if, if, if we make this guarantee of, of medical conditions. Again, we should look at, the, at your language and we're not lawyers, but the, what we do know definitively that there is no employment law that, def that covers medical conditions with household members. We would be breaking far and away new ground and have the most accommodating set of supports uh, that I I've seen in any plan, certainly in the, certainly in the state. Um, so I I'm not unsympathetic to, to, the, to the very real health conditions and neither will Doreen <laughs> or whoever in our administration is evaluating and making these calls when they seek to accommodate our staff, but but it's 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 a zero sum game where you if if you tip the scale like that you are you are you you are saying you can't guarantee the legally required FAPE for our most vulnerable students and and that has dire and real consequences. I, I think I would also to to build on that for from my thought process is also this idea of of the equity amongst the staff. Because not all jobs are able to be conducted remotely, and so when you when you talk about you mentioned Ms. Spitzer that you you thought that it was a false dichotomy that if we if we offer this if we offer staff choice then we have to go 100% distance, and it does seem extreme, but if you follow it through to this this sense of it, it, this, I mean, this literally just happened in Fairfax County and Loudoun County and Montgomery County in the DC area, that by looking at staff choice, they realize that they do not have the ability to even have any in-person learning, regard, even with, with the, um, the proportion of staff that would like to be in person. And that's where it tips the scales. You have custodial staff. There's, 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 very little need for custodial staff if you're if you're doing 100% distance learning. And to his point about offering staff choice, what is the what is a reasonable accommodation for somebody who works in in um, who who's a school nurse if the school nurse doesn't want to work in in person? Um, we also have the situation, um, and and I know we're we're not talking we're 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 talking about sort of the the gut-wrenching decisions that individuals are going to be making and families are going to be making, but we, we are a public body that is fiscally, we're, we're charged with the fiscal operation of our, of our school system. And one of the other things that falls apart when we, when, if we're, if we're offering 100% choice and then we have to go to 100% distance learning is the, the transportation. We've, we have a contract, we have to provide transportation in, in, in the region, so we will lose the transportation reimbursement and, and, and we have bus drivers, right? So there's, there's a whole, it feels it, at, at first glance as a false dichotomy, but it, it falls apart as, as Mr. Demling was, was alluding to, as soon as, you, as soon as you tip that balance and you, and you can't match the their, um, uh, staff desires with student needs. And there's a real, real budget implication on that as well. I will share the language. Um, I, sorry, I did not request a fifth to speak, but is that okay? Oh, I didn't hear your question, sorry. Sorry, I, I did not ask to be recognized, so. I oh, yes, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, 
I also, this is not language that is saying, first of all, reasonable accommodation uh, from my reading of some of the documents you shared does not necessarily mean working remote 100% of the time. Um, that is, and, and that's not what the language here says. And I, again, I do have a lot of confidence in Doreen's abilities um, to, to work with people. And from everything I hear, all of this is going to be have to be made on an individual case by case basis. Um, so these two bullets are my proposed revisions. I, I would like to say, you know, I, it's, it's really, you know, I, I think what I'm, I'm not right now saying full choice because of the reasons I, I of wanting to, like Peter mentioned, you know, protect our obligations to meet the needs of students, especially those who are most vulnerable with special needs, those who are younger, those who are homeless, the, 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 the groups we are facing in first. I'm concerned that if we, we could end up in the situation that you guys are describing, regardless of whether or not we seek people's preferences. Nobody is an indentured servant, you know, they're going to have the ability to decide not to come to school that we can't, we, you know, they may decide to, to leave the district. And I think that would be really terrible. Um, it, anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'll put the language up here. Um, Mr. Deming. Yeah, just a brief question. So, um, I know we're not supposed to ask one on one questions, so I'll just throw it out there. I'm, I'm wondering what, what the difference is um it, i'm wondering what the preference difference is between in this first bullet reasonable accommodations versus what's already in the document which is seek to accommodate and the reason i ask that is because this is a non-binding guidance document that describes the school committee's intention to what how we want the district to operate and so in a practical purpose this this is really direction to hr in terms of what they do and and i'm, I'm not seeing any practical difference between our very clear um, direction of, from the school committees to human resources and the district to seek to accommodate versus reasonable accommodations. So I, I guess I just, I, I don't understand how that's stronger. My, my thought was that it says will instead of will seek. Mr. Demling. So, I mean, if, if we, maybe this is software engineering me. If, if, if we were writing a computer program, I would get really, really uh, picky about these word choices. Um, I, I don't think for, for what this document is, again, which is, is a non-binding, but, but we expect to be followed um, expression of our of our values um, for the district's human resources to take into account when they are evaluating individual situations. Um, I don't, I, I can't imagine, and may, maybe I'm wrong, I can't imagine a, a member of our district working in HR, you know, sincerely valuing our teachers and uh, reading will seek to accommodate and thinking that, that that's weak or any weaker than reasonable accommodations. Um, I, 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 again, this, it, it, it comes back to what, what, what are we, what, what are we trying to express? Um, so I, I, I just, you know, I, I, um, and, 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 and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, you know, I, I, I am really concerned about the delay. Like, it's hard to say publicly, but we are already really late and another five days for this, all this uncertainty to hang out um, is, is, is just not, not good. And then, and then, you know, the possible discussion that happens and pretty soon we, 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 we just have to call it full remote and, and start sending people away. Um, kids, I mean. Um, so I guess, you know, I, in terms of like what we're trying to do, which is strengthen the consideration of our district 
um, but not bind them because I, I, again, like we have to staff these programs. Like that's, that is the, that is the reality. Like faith has not been waived in COVID. It was, it was uh, when we first went to uh, quarantine and schools were closed in March, you know, schools were allowed to have everybody remote, but that's because of the prevailing COVID conditions and, and what was, which, which is, which is not what it is at the moment. So, um, you know, I, 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 I feel similar in, in the, the, the feeling that you that, that is being expressed with this proposed change, but I don't see how it how it strengthens um, what what the I, actual actions would be. Sorry if that was long. Yeah. Sorry. And I it, it's a it's a really good I, and I know this is, we we'll spend hours talking about the meaning of two different words. Um but I, I do actually think um I actually think that the your the proposed wording actually weakens what we might be doing for staff with household members. And, and the reason why I say that is because the, the second bullet cites specifically the preference for full or mostly remote work as that they're seeking to accommodate as much, you know, to the extent possible, the, de the, the desire for full or mostly remote work. So very specific. And in fact, that is predominantly the kinds of accommodations that we're hearing from staff. Um, uh, the, you know, the emails, the public comment um, are, are really asking for remote, remote learning opportunities. The first bullet, to your point, Ms. Spitzer, reasonable accommodations does not necessarily mean remote work. I'm not sure that's going to be um, considered a positive change from some of, from the many teachers that are asking for us to provide 100% distance learning or enable them to not have to come into the school buildings because as you rightly pointed out Ms. Spitzer that a reasonable accommodation does not necessarily mean distance it could mean okay you're only going to be working with you are going to be working in this isolation and this is this is your your new job um, and that's not what staff is asking. So I actually think that that keeping it in the second bullet is actually stronger guidance in saying that we're actually going to seek to accommodate your desire to work offsite and not in the school buildings. Ms. Spitzer? So if this is non-binding and only guidance, then why are folks bringing to telling me that if we change this language, we will then need to move to a fully remote option. Because what I, I just don't think you can have it both ways. I don't think you can say that if the Amherst district fails to come to agreement on this language, then we are in a situation where it's all fully remote. And I have, you know, not just me, but, but the, the, those of us who feel uncomfortable with this language have essentially you know, forced the district into a situation that they find untenable and is going to have fiscal consequences and, and do all of these really things that I, I don't want to see. So this is, this, I just, I'm trying to under, it just feels like I, I'm, I'm trying to come here with some, some really, you know, I think valid concerns and I'm, I'm feeling like I'm not being hurt and, and oh, not only that, but at the same time being blamed for a situation that I, if, if it really isn't non-binding, then I don't understand then why, why everything is getting um, pinned on, on this language change. Mr. Demling. So again, I'm tr trying not to have one-on-one -on -one comments. Um, I don't want anyone to be blamed. Um, you know, it is what it is. Like, this is the process. It's hard. It is what it is. Um, obviously, the sooner we can raise these concerns, the better. Um, it's unfortunate that we're having this much of a, of a major pushback right at the very end. Um, but it, 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 it is what it is what it is. Um, I, so if, if we tell the district that, that you have to accommodate staff preference, then, then, then the district cannot reliably staff on site learning in any kind of equitable manner. I, I'll just assume that we all agree on that, unless you want to go through the superintendent's, um, um, bullets, um, that if, that if we can't guarantee the staffing, uh, then, then we can't do on-site learning in an equitable manner. Therefore, it has to be all remote. Um, 
I don't, I don't think that's, I guess I'll stop there. That's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure how productive that comment was. I, I think the, 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 the question is in my mind, if we're saying that it's non-binding, that it's guidance and very strong guidance, I would add, um, then I'm feeling uncomfortable upsetting and delaying it, it sort of the entire um, decision framework or, um, and, and steps that still need to happen from a timing perspective that are going to have um, real repercussions um, in in the district's planning and ability to plan and, and start school on time. It's going to have real repercussions for families who are really anxious to know what what's going to be happening in the fall. And I'm not sure I'm willing to do that for something that is a non-binding document. And so, and so that's actually a bigger reason why I support our original wording because then we, we haven't lost any time if we were able to support that original document tonight. Um, we've, we've had deeper conversations and I, and I think it's important. So I'm not like, like Mr. Demling, we, this, we're, we're five individuals and in, in this conversation four, but um, who bring different perspectives and that's absolutely expected for us to have different opinions. That's not, it's not about blaming somebody for having a different opinion. Um, but I, I do feel, it, so, and I, so I think it's great and helpful for us to have this deep conversation um, tonight. That said, I'm not sure that the semantics between those two bullets is important enough in a guidance document for us to delay any further um, and um, the decisions that still have to come because there's so many details that still need to be worked out and so many spending and implementation decisions. And to Ms. Lord's comments earlier, conversations that need to be happening within with the staff in the buildings to figure out how we're gonna actually implement that super high level plan that we saw on Tuesday. And that's where, that's where for me, it's really hard to consider changing this document. Mr. Demling? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up because it circles back to Ms. Lord's point about, you know, these voices need to be heard. We need to get these questions answered. So our, our role in the process is holding that up. So, so there was, there was a, a, a huge list sent from some Cocker Farm educated superintendent of, of questions so far, many of which can't be answered because we don't have the framework completely finished and we don't have the model voted. Um, but he answered those. From what I understand, every overture um, of, of meeting and wanting to communicate with the superintendent, he's accepted from, uh, from, from, from the union. We, we have a bullet in there in this support staff document that um, the district will work with the leadership of its collective bargaining units to try to address other points of concern to staff. Um, superintendent, as I understand, the union sent a, a very long list of questions to the superintendent, so he's got to work through those. So many of those are TBD, 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 and until until we're done, you know, like we're holding up the whole process, um, and and I absolutely like agree with Miss Lord, like those conversations need to happen, but like they can't happen to finality until we until, until we set this, and um and the reason why collective bargaining, why I like collective bargaining in there, is is, is that is the structure of of how we operate as an employment organization, is that we, if there are major concerns then uh, employees bring it to union leadership, union leadership brings it to district leadership, and they, and they, and they work out the whys and the where to for us. And it's our job to set the model of, of the structure of the, how the education is going to be provided. Um, you know, so uh, I, 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 I ab absolutely agree with that, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that that, not ha that conversation having not been completed is, isn't a reason to to, to, to not be able to, to support the, the strength of this recommendation. Which again, I mean, I, I don't want to lose sight of it is, and I haven't read every plan in the country, but this is the most accommodating plan to staff I have read. <laughs> if, there's, if there's a more accommodating one, you know, I, I, we, we could talk about it, but it's, it, it goes above and beyond. And, and we are saying so strongly and loudly with these meetings um, that we are directing to the superintendent and the district 
that, that they need to they need they need to seek to accommodate staff as much as possible while fulfilling our core obligation um and 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 you know not not ter not uh, yeah while fulfilling our core obligation Ms. Lloyd, you you unmuted yourself. Did you want to say something? Um, I just am a little confused if it's a recommendation and or non-binding why everything had to stop when it didn't pass because like that confuses me. Um, we don't have to go go into it right now, but I'm I'm still trying to understand if it's guidance and a recommendation, then why is it now shut down because we didn't agree to it, Mr. Deming? So I'm I, I'm only this is just uh, my memory of what the superintendent said. So I'm not like, you know, I'm not speaking for the superintendent. But basically, it was unclear at the end of the previous conversation last Tuesday whether the our committee was seriously considering allowing staff uh, choice under any option or under some limited option where the district could not guarantee staffing, either for part or all of our on-site staffing for part or all of the model. And so you can't go out to parents and say, hey, we're gonna have K to six phased in four to five days a week if you can't guarantee that you're gonna have the staff for it, right? Um, so uh, I, I think, I, I think that's, that's, that's the, the stoppage in the, in the process, from my, from my understanding. And because the conversation was, was going that direction and we didn't have a document that, that had sort of that proposed that language and so the assumption was is that it was going to be more this this full choice so Ms. Spitzer you had your hand raised so I'm just trying to think through the path forward because it's almost eight o'clock at night I'd like to put my kids to bed and, and I also hear Peter's concerns loud and clear I agree with him we do need to to move forward our district needs to make decisions I'm not hearing support for the language I proposed. I'm not, and I get it that maybe this language isn't the right language. I think you guys understand clearly. I think I've expressed very clearly my concern, the population I'm most concerned about. Um, and I'm also not hearing support for changing the language to make it more clear or strengthen anything. Um, we are four people and I don't, I can't, I think I have a, anyway. So if we fail to come to an agreement on a change in the language, I don't see a way that the all choice model is going to move forward either. And I'm, it, it, it seems like we're polarized right now. We're four, so two, two, I, I'm, I don't know what, how, I, I can't assume what any, but, it could, I, but I could see that happening if we vote. So if we don't decide on, on either approving this or a revision to this, because I'm, I think I don't see either of those outcomes happening right now. Will we then um, default to like letting the depart, like, I mean, then the region and Pelham will have, have the, the document that you shared with us earlier tonight as, as their guiding principles. Will Amherst just not have guiding principles on that? And will that stop them from moving forward? Or will they be able to move forward with the presentation that we saw last, I guess it was, sorry, Tuesday night. I'm just trying to think through because I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of compromise right now, so. Mr. Denley. Yep. Okay, there you go. My, my first time here tonight. Um, so I feel like we have to do everything we possibly can to move this forward tonight. And I have other obligations at 8.30, um, but I mean, like, if, if, and if we need to take a break for 15 minutes and come back, I'm willing to do that. But I, I feel like we, we, we have to do everything we can to try and forge through, um, forge, forge a path forward through tonight as excruciatingly painful as it may be at points. Um, that's just process wise. Um, so he, here's a thought. Um, and I'm really not trying to, I honestly am not trying to do this, Ms. Spitzer, to disenfranchise your point of view. Okay, it's going to sound like this. But, but what about this? I'm so, I'm just trying to be very authentic and transparent and honest. Um, what what if what if we um, what if we took a vote on um, on the 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 document as presented, which I understand is a difference of opinion that a change would make it stronger. 
if so but we at least get to that point because right now the default is employment law and employment law is less accommodating than what we've identified it doesn't it doesn't have it's pretty much that first bullet in in different words right it doesn't have seek to accommodate uh including concerns about households it doesn't have um um an emphasis on working with leadership of collecting bargaining units to address all the other points it doesn't have uh provide time training pd it doesn't have um providing opportunities for staff to provide feedback some of those things we might just expect normally of a responsible district but it doesn't have those things particularly that second one so, so that gets us so we're at default right employment law that gets us to this level if 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 we still think that there is additional um uh strengthening that can happen then then before we took that vote um and i'm making this motion up on my on the fly um we could move uh that we uh, consider additions um, to this document in, in, with our joint committee, um, net, which, where the meeting is already scheduled next Tuesday. That way, we say yes. We all agree to to to, to this. We all agree with for employment law. We agree to these additional accommodations, and then we we also agree that we are going to have a discussion among our three committees. And if there's, you know. A, a massive change of heart, then then so be it. But if not, then then we move on, and uh, you know, and we respect the fact that we are a a a, um, a divided group of people, and we have different points of view about what should happen where and what what language. Um, that that that's the best path forward I can I can think of now. I'm also I also don't want to assume anybody's vote, by the way. Um, so you know, I don't want to pigeonhole anybody. And so I'm not saying this under the presumption that a vote would go 3-1 or 2-2. Two, two. Um, even if I thought that a vote would go 3-1 right now, I don't want to have it at this minute because I would like really to, um, for us to be, ideally for us to be unanimous so that we are, you know, supporting the same uh, path going forward. And that's a stronger message to the community. Um, anybody else's thoughts on that? Sorry, I was, um... I was pulling up the letter from the superintendent with the, in case that was helpful um, to share on screen for people to see what he's outlined as what would happen um, if, if we do not come to some agreement on the document. Um, so I missed the motion the, the or the the crafting of a potential motion that you at the beginning of your statement, Mr. Downing, could you restate it succinctly? Yeah. So, so, okay, maybe not succinctly. I'm just a second draft. Um, uh, that that we that we commit to to reconsidering. Uh, uh, we commit to uh, we commit to discussing um, potential additions to the support for staff document with our other two committees. And and hopefully, and I, I can't speak for the superintendent and the other building principals. But I, I think I think if we pass the same document with the same level of accommodations that the other two districts have passed, um, that should be enough to move things forward. And then if if at some point we decide as school committees that yes, we understand that this that something might cause a major disruption. Yes, we understand the consequences and the ABCs. But we if if for, if that were to happen, well then we would need to reassess. But at least we get the train moving down the track. You know, the I, I'm I'm. I know everybody else is too. I'm very, very concerned that we are quite late. And even though the state doesn't want us deciding anything in about three weeks, which is insanity, um, we are we are very late with this process. And um, uh, you know, and 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 we, I feel like we need to kind of get out of the way. Like we've 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 we we have been at this for a, a long time and given a lot of effort, and we need to if we can't come to agreement about, about what that addition is, let's at least get to what we agree is, it, you know, that, that level of accommodation. Um, I'm not trying to disenfranchise anybody. I'm not trying to like, you know, uh, do something quick and dirty. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of a way that we can, we can get people moving and we can, we can say, this is the model. Like, of course the school committee at any time could change its mind on a number of things, but, but that's not the case right now. This is, this is what we at least commit to. Um, so can I try restating sure. that in a <laughs> succinct way? Um, number one, 
that we would look to a motion to commit to um, drafting amendments um, or additions to the document with the other committees. So we, as, a, as the Amherst School Committee, would would commit to doing that at, a, at our next scheduled joint meeting. And then number two, we would pass the current doc, we would move to vote and pass the current document as it stands to be aligned with the other committees. But we've, we've already first committed that we're going to take up the discussion of the, of addendums. Is that representing it? Mr. Denley? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, and you know, as I'm thinking about a couple of other benefits of this process, um, if it's amenable is um, we could, we could run, both the, the language by council so that we, we're not speculating about what about what uh what things what things might mean but we would have an actual you know we could we could definitely ask him to put put his opinion in writing about about um the spitzer's proposed change um we would have the superintendent uh there to answer clarifying questions so that we are not um speculating about what he did or didn't say with regards to the written state so he did give us a written statement um, but you know, there's all obviously questions that may come up that we might want to ask. That would be a, a deeper um, uh, point of view. And if we wanted the assistant superintendent there, uh, as I said a few times, uh, you know, and in charge of HR, if we say, okay, if you had this language, how are you approaching? Situ you know, obviously not with personal details, but like, but how are you approaching um, this evaluation? And if you had this language, how would it change you? Um, and then we could we could have that informed decision, um, but. But, but but we at least agree to that you know what the but what the standard it currently is in the um in the document for today so that the train can keep going any comments or thoughts on on mr demling's proposal So, um, Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, I, I'm being slow because I want to give an opportunity for, you know, I feel like I've been driving this conversation a lot. So, but um, I'm also, I'm happy to be in that position. So here's, um, like so many things that we've had to make decisions make, it doesn't feel good. I'm not gonna sleep much better tonight. I think if that's what happens, I, I, I still feel strongly that um, we, I, I guess where I'm still like, I, I just want this to have as much, I, I want staff to feel like we've got their back and, and I want students to feel that way too. And I, and I, I think we're hearing most strongly from the staff right now. And, and maybe these are not representative because I am not, you know, I, I, I haven't, it's not my role to go out and survey and talk to every single staff person, but from the public comment I'm getting, I'm hearing folks who are really feeling like they need more support and more um, reassurance. And, and maybe that's just a matter of time and, and getting into the weeds and getting, you know, holding the info session that we want. And maybe these are things that'll make people feel more supported, but I'm, I, this is my, you know, I'm not doing this to try to, you know, derail plans or anything. I'm doing it because I'm hearing pretty loud and clear that there are members of our community, teachers and staff who feel real valid concerns. And so that, that that's why I, I want to put that out there is like, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this just to, you know, stand on a high horse or push us towards a fully remote option. Those, those are not my, it, it's just trying to, to do this. So I, I would, I, I, I'd, I'd like to hear what everybody has to think about this before I make a final vote on this, but I, I think I could probably do that. I similarly want to hear from council. I similarly want to hear from HR and the superintendent. I, you know, I, I have, you know, had some conversations with him, but I'd like to have an open conversation with him publicly about this. Um, you know, I didn't just dream this up on completely on my own. <laughs> um, so I, I think, um, I, I think I could do what Peter's suggesting. I, it, like I said, it doesn't feel good and I don't wanna, and I just feel like they're probably, you know, 
there are going to be lots of people watching who are unhappy on like there's no way we're going to make everybody happy that's just the, the this role and it's not our job i'm just trying to do right by both the students and the teachers and i'm i'm not sure how to do it but this is this is i'm trying my best and i think we all are and there's no right solution i i think um I, I, I want to just be clear in case it hasn't been that I, I also want you want to signal and, and you know as you said you know that we have their back the staff that so it's not and you know these these questions keep me up at night they wake me up in the middle of the night they wake I wake up in the morning thinking about this so it's it's not for any lack of concern or care or, or thought from all the conversations that I've been having with teachers, um, all the text messages and emails that we've been getting from teachers and staff. That's, it's, it's that, that just like, you know, like it, it affects me to my core. And I, and I, f I do, do really, really believe that what we've put together really does say that, that we are, that we want to seek to accommodate them. And within the statement that we are a public school and we need, and we need to be making decisions for students first. And we, we can't put ourselves in a situation that we're, that we're going to balancing or doing anything less than what we believe is, is sort of, is, is that free and appropriate public education for our students and achieving our mission. We've been accused in the past of running a school for the purpose of the adults. This, I fear that by saying and compromising on sort of what we might be meeting and meeting the desires and needs of the families of, of the students in our, in, our, in our districts, that we would be doing that. Um, it, it, it's not, it, it, I don't, I also don't want it to be an either or. I want everybody to feel safe. I want everybody to feel, um, uh, accommodated. I want everybody to feel like we've we've got their best interests in mind. And how do we do that while still fulfilling our our mission and our obligation to the students in our district and our mission? That's it, you know I, I, I've heard others talk about it as a zero sum game. We can't we can't we can't meet both one hundred percent. And I feel really um, strongly that the document that we've drafted originally really does say very strongly and clearly that we want to make sure that our staff are taken care of as much as possible while also delivering on the needs of our of the students in our care. Um, Ms. Um, but all of that said, I'm also um, open to the the proposal that Mr. Demling, um, Mr. Demling um, uh, suggested and outlined and in particular because of the opportunity that that would bring us to have that conversation with um, with the superintendent present um, if the assistant superintendent was also able um, and and to join us um, and 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 get more of that input and to understand sort of these nuances that we're we're trying to answer here and none of us are, are labor lawyers or um, or um, HR professionals so um, Ms. Lord, I, I thought, were you wanting to say something? Um, yes. So I understand not prioritizing adults. Students have always been my number one priority. Um, some people might have tried to challenge that on Monday. But I also know that if our teacher or a worker is forced and anxious and, and not healthy, then they're not going to be able to serve our students as well as they could if so I just wanted to make that straight that I'm not prioritizing the privileged or the adults or anything um, at all. I'm a little hesitant about the proposal and part of me, it's trust issues. It almost sounds like we'll say whatever we need to say to get it passed and then we might not live up to the honor or the commitment that we made to actually talk about amendments and that's no that's not a, um, a personal slight on any of you. It's just the way institutions can work. Um, and we're, cause we're in such a hurry and we're behind and I understand that, but that's also a culture that sometimes forces us to rush through. So 
I want to thank each and every one of you. It's been a lot this week. We're all working really hard to try to find um, some middle ground. And I think that's all I have to say for now. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Demling. So before I make a motion, so one, one thing that, um, I understand the trust issue in institutions, absolutely. Um, so the one uh, fortuitous thing uh, in, in that respect though, is that we already have a joint meeting of our three committees scheduled for next Tuesday. So when we pass a motion that says at our next joint meeting, there's already a time, it's, we're not like, ah, you know, we'll figure it out, it's, it's already there. <laughs> we know when it's gonna happen. Um, so, you know, we at least have that. Um, and, and, and before I make a motion, the other comment I, I, I would have is, um, if we could um, uh, have anybody, anybody here, or, and, and maybe anybody, maybe the chairs, um, uh, Ms. McDonald's clone and, and Ms. Hall, uh, if reach out to our committees, update them on what happens at the end of this meeting, assuming what happens happens, um, and say, if you have questions for council um, about specific language and what it means, you know, please articulate them to the chairs and the chairs will collect them all and and forward them to council and council will do their best to um, you know, provide, provide a written response. Um, I think that's probably the best, uh, the best avenue to, to provide another resource for, for reference, so. I would like to, add, I, 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 I get that sort of feeling of uncertainty of kicking the can down the road on the, the commitment at that next meeting. And, and I'll add that if we voted on a different document tonight, there's no guarantee that the other two districts would vote um, would vote that, and we'd be back, we'd ba be back in the situation that we were on Tuesday morning. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like this is this is a a better solution to get us hopefully to you know to some something that works well for everybody, um, as opposed to you know moves us forward and then potentially could put it, set us all the way back to Tuesday morning and we have nothing again. So. Mr. Demling. Uh, I move that we consider additions to the staff support doc, staff support guidance document at our next uh, joint meeting with the Amherst Pelham and Pelham School Committees. A second. And the motion um, by Demling, second and by Spitzer. Any further discussion? I just, yeah, can I just make a comment? So I, I just want to say, I think we get along most of the time, you know, it's very rare that we have these um, really split votes or difficult conversations. And I think this is the time to have them because this is the map. This is what matters most. What we're doing right now is the hardest and also the most important. So thank you for continuing to show up. This has been difficult and I, you know, I appreciate all the hard work everybody's doing. Mr. Demling. Well said. And and I will I will pile on that that train as well. Um, I, I um, couldn't have asked for a, a, a better, stronger, more committed and supportive um, committee of colleagues. So so thank you for saying that, Ms. Spitzer. Um, so we'll move to a, a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Could you please repeat the motion for me? The motion was to consider additions to the staff document with the other three committees at our next joint meeting. Lord, aye. <laughs> Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, I. The motion passes uh, four, zero, and when I'm not present. Would some um, well, I, I guess I'll make the the next motion. Um, I move that we uh, um, approve the um, uh, framework. Sorry, it fell off of my screen. Um, the framework for planning fall 2020 um, support for staff section as um, 
as uh, presented and amended on Monday, July 20th. Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Demling. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes four zero when not present. Thank you, everybody. I hear the difficulty and, and challenge in, in that vote. Um, and we will amend our agenda on um, for two. Actually, no, it's already on our agenda as such. So we're good. I will tell Mr. Harrington that he may return. And he's back. Um, uh, just to recap, Mr. Harrington, we um, voted a motion to take up this uh, the, uh, the discussion of potential additions to the original staff section on um, at our joint meeting, three committees meeting on Tuesday, um, and then we voted to approve the original um, the original document that was in our packets this evening. Um, our next order of business is to accept gifts, and we do not have any gifts um, that, that I'm aware of. Um, so does somebody have a final motion? I Mr. move to adjourn. Oh. <laughs> second. Moved by Harrington, seconded by Spitzer. There's no discussion. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night.